Well, thank you very much for a very nice introduction, Professor Matsuda. And I'd like to also thank for the uh, organizer for the invitation to the third Kyoto University in the Mori Foundation Joint Kyoto Prize Symposium. I'm pretty sure uh, we know we have to die. But many people think we don't want to die by cancer. However, unfortunately, every year, we have 14 million people diagnosed with cancer all over the world. So what can we do? And I got a great idea listening to the previous two speakers. For my grand-grandchildren, I asked them to get parents sequenced and repaired by CRISPR-Cas9. That will avoid. Now, that is a very far away what we can do is usually either get operated or irradiation or chemo. But today, I'd like to introduce there is another way to treat cancer. That is the immunotherapy. It started early uh, the end of 19th century by German doctor Coley, who injected bacterial toxin and to stimulate human immune response. But certainly this didn't work. And many people used BCZ or some cytokines or luck therapy still going on somewhere. And these trials are all rather non-specific stimulation of immune system. But the 1990 Terry Boone and others discovered tumor-associated antigen, which now we call neoantigen. It derived from our own cell, but it differs from our genome-encoded protein. So this discovery led to the activation immune system by several ways, including cancer vaccination, type 1, TH1 type, uh, immunotherapy, adaptive transfer of cytotoxic cell, many others. But only very recently, we started to introduce new way, in contrast to the previous strategy, the new strategy is to stop our break of the immune system. And in fact, there are several very clear-cut reports immunotherapy is working, in, or at least should work, but people didn't believe. 2001, Bob Schreiber reported, this is a carcinogen-induced tumor development in wild-type mice. This is the days after uh, chemicals injection. But if you destroy your adaptive immune system, the RAG2 is a critical gene, you get very higher number of cancers. So immune system always watching to avoid any tumor genesis. He further went on very critical experiments, just wait until spontaneous tumor develop in mice. So here, again, this is a control, this is no tumor, and this is a benign tumor, and this is the very bad tumor, adenocarcinoma. So just blocking the acquired immunity, you begin to get cancer. But if you destroy both natural and acquired immunity, the frequency of tumor development enormously goes up. In addition, in human, there are very good statistics. When the organ transplant received immunosuppressive therapy, they get higher incidence of tumor. This is number of expected frequency of tumor genesis on different region of the body. But always, immunosuppressive treated patient has much higher incidence. So all these data strongly indicates our body immune system is very important to prevent cancer. That immunologists call immune surveillance. 
Now, the immune tolerance is the opposite. It's actually avoid excessive immune response. And the balance of the immune surveillance and immune tolerance is very critical. One, for the infectious, if you get immune tolerance, you get either infectious diseases or cancer. But if you have strong immune surveillance, you can avoid tumor, but you get autoimmunity. And there are several measures to introduce immune tolerance. That means suppress immune system. And there, PD-1, CTL-4 as a negative regulator, regulatory T cells, suppressive vomal derived cells, suppressive cytokines, and down regulation of MSC class one, which is critical for antigen recognition. Basically, cancer immunotherapy is reactivation of immune surveillance, which normally takes place. The immunologist believes immune surveillance working so majority of the tumor, when born, it's kicked out and eliminated. But somehow, tumor cell override the function of the immune system, and therefore, tumor begin to grow. This is a state of immune tolerance, so we need some measure to push it back to the immune surveillance. So, as I said, many people tried for this direction, cancer antigen vaccination, activation immune cell in vitro and put it back to the patient, and also cytokines like gamma interferon. And none worked. So people are very much disappointed, but only recently, we and others introduced new strategy. That is breakage of negative regulators. It's like a car driving. If you brake, you stop the brake, the car runs faster. That will be good for the tumor surveillance. Now, uh, this is the most complicated slide, so I just go quickly. You imagine you are driving a car. The first step you drive a car is get out of the parking lot. So first thing you do is release the parking brake. And this parking brake is called CTL4. And this brake is all or none. There is no intermediate. And actually this is the case because CD28, CTL4 compete the same ligand. So either brake or axle. The second stage is of course running on the road. There, you need a brake and axle in balance. You have to manipulate between 10 kilometers per hour up to, I don't know, depends on the person. But you need reasonable balance. And therefore, we have brake called a PD-1 and ICOS for axle, and each has its own ligand. So this way, you have a balance. Now, the, this is very fortunate. Uh, we discovered our actually bumped into the PD-1 cDNA in 1992. Graduate student, Yas Masa Ishida, was trying to identify apoptotic regulatory proteins in thymic cell lines. She, he did subtractive hybridization and identified very strongly induced cDNA, which we named program cell death one. And this protein has a very unique structure in the, in the cytoplasmic protein. First of all, it's a transmembrane protein expressed on the uh, T and B cell when activated, and it has a very highly conserved tyrosine residue two positions which are very similar to many other surface proteins required for lymphocyte activation, but clearly different from the space in between. So we thought this might be interesting, but we didn't know what they are doing. The expression profile is also very interesting. 
PD-1, which is green, is expressed on the light zone of germinal center where the lymphocyte is selected for high affinity antibody production. And CD3, which is a marker of T cell, CD20 is a marker of B cell. Both express PD-1 because you see yellow color. So based on these findings, we decided to not make a knockout animals, but poor Hiroshi Nishimura, he really struggled. We got the ES knockout, 93, and homozygous animals, nothing happened. So Dr. Minato advised me to back cross to the uh, inbred line, and it took years. And then finally, we begin to see some sign of activation of immune system. And eventually, we see this causes autoimmune diseases. The results clearly indicate the protein is working as a negative regulator. In black mice, they show nephritis and arthritis. And white mice shows dilated cardiomyopathy and gastritis. NOD background, which shows very uh, frequent diabetes, it shows very accelerated and severe diabetes. And same MLL background, which shows myocarditis, it really gets worse. So these results convinced us this must be a negative regulator. Once you get this idea, it's not that far to apply this to the either infection prevention or tumor therapy. So we collaborated with the uh, uh, Harvard group to identify the ligand for PD-1. And we succeeded identifying two ligand, L1 and L2. And we could clearly show these two ligands induce the phosphorylation of intercellular domain of PD-1, and that recruits phosphatase called SHUP2. And phosphatase removed the phosphate, which was induced by antigen recognition uh, receptor, TCR or BCR. So with this, we try to demonstrate whether blocking of the PD-1 can be used for the cancer therapy or the infectious disease therapy. So first thing we asked, I, I asked to Dr. Iwai, then the graduate student and soon become postdoc, is to test what happens in PD-1 deficient animals. And what she did, this is not that beautiful at the first experiments, this is a one we published. But we clearly see the difference, clear difference. This is very convincing. So we collaborated with Dr. Minato and injected. Uh, Dr. Minato produced antibody against ligand one, and we can clearly see the difference in the tumor growth and also survival of animals. Dr. Ui further went on to see whether anti-PD-1 treatment affects metastasis of the melanoma, which you can easily recognize as a black mass into the liver metastasis. So she injected in the spleen and wait whether the tumor uh, grow in the liver or not. You can clearly see either PD-1 deficiency or anti-PD-1 injection, both suppress the tumor growth in liver. So at that time, we had a very naive idea. Either tumor cell or the antigen-presenting cell, or both, may express PD ligand on surface. And actually, there are several reports on that. This will inhibit growth, uh, sorry, the function of activation of killer T cells and tumor can grow. So just giving antibody to block this interaction 
will help to activate killer cell and attack tumor. And based on this idea, I asked uh, our partner on a pharmaceutical industry with whom we own the patent to find a partner. Uh, this was the most difficult part. Not a single company is willing to invest. And they spent more than one year, and I decided to work by myself with a venture company in the United States. And I told Ono, and then, soon after, Ono came back to me, I would do it. So I didn't know what happened, but it, in fact, I was fortunate the Medalex, American venture capital, already had the technology to produce humanized immunoglobulin approach to Ono and started the collaboration. And they quickly produced anti-PD-1, IgG4, which can be quickly approved as investigation new drug by FDA and clinical trials started in Japan and the United States and States 2006 and 2009 in Japan. And Medalex was quickly bought by Bristol Meyer, which majors by cancer, so it was very fortunate. Everything went very smooth afterwards. The first clinical trial data uh, was published in New England Journal of Medicine 2012. So data was striking. The many big media covered outside Japan. Uh, 296 terminal stage patients recruited, and that include non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, and renal cancer. And surprisingly, 20 to 30 percent of patients rescued and survived few years, at least. Most striking effect is the many patients the size of tumor did not reduce, but it sustained many years. So the number shown here is by weeks. So this dot line shows the termination of the treatment. So they stopped the treatment after six months. And some patients clearly show the reduction of tumor size, but most striking this, what they call stable disease, tumor size stays there, but did not grow. So we also studied collaboration with John Ecology Department in the Kyoto University Hospital. And here again, we got the same phenotype. The cohort is a bit small, one milligram per kilo 10, three milligram per kilo 10, 20, but complete response and the partial response is a bit lower, but still, again, you have to remember this is a very terminal stage of ovarian cancer, which is very bad. If we include stable disease, actually 40 to 50 percent of the terminal stage of ovarian cancer patient rescued and survived years. And uh, I just show you one case 60 years old lady, which has a big tumor, and after four month treatment, it almost gone. And uh, this is a tumor marker, and again, it quickly went down. And uh, last year, she appeared on TV show, and showing she is play golf. So overall, <coughs> survival is very impressive. In this case, treatment was terminated at 12 months, one year, but still after uh, more than a year, the survival curve remained the same. So effect is quite durable. Uh, this is again similar plot of tumor size up and down, and again, many patients survive at the same level of tumor size long term. 
Uh, this is the same water flood, uh, for plot, and the, some patient has really shrink the tumor, but there are many patients who stay the same level of tumor size, but uh, stay there for years. One issue still we have not solved, originally we thought ligand expression on tumor is the good marker for effectiveness, but in fact, PD ligand high patient not always respond to the uh, PD-1 treatment. So this is still big argument in the field. Uh, subsequently, a huge number of clinical trial data have been published. Uh, this is the best case of the Hodgkin lymphoma. The 23 patients, almost all of them responded, more or less. And the untreated melanoma. The previous one is terminal stage, but when you start this treatment from the beginning of the, just after the diagnosis, this is survival of the patient, 100%, and after year and a half, 70% alive. And the control is the carbazine is a typical chemotherapy, less than 20% patients survive. It was so clear difference. So why does anti-PD-1 antibody work? I think this has been already mentioned by previous speakers, and tumor cells continuously mutate and produce non-self antigens. Therefore, a large immune repertoire can recognize and attack almost all cancer antigens. This is a basic line. In most of the cases, immune surveillance can recognize all these mutant proteins, recognize and kill. However, tumor cell may induce some mechanism which are totally unknown, immune tolerance and glow. Normally, anti-PD-1 breaks immune tolerance and push back to the immune surveillance. But sometimes, we don't know the reason. It doesn't work. So cartoon, what I mentioned is here. So tumor cell treated by chemo. The chemo induce kind of selection because you cannot kill every single tumor cell. And often chemo is a mutagen. And that causes resistant tumor cell. And another chemo do the same thing. And eventually, we have lots of mutant uh, cancer cells. But fortunately, lymphocytes have enormous repertoire, 10 to 14th or even more, and can take care of all these mutants. As, I, as you heard already, cancer cells accumulate enormous mutation, 100 times or 1,000 times more than a normal cell. And there are different types of tumors. And the whole genome sequence already published and studied extensively. And all these mutants are a target of the immune system. The rationale was, as I explained, but the fact is also published last year by Hopkins group. They compared two cohorts of the colon cancer. Those group which has a mutation is mismatch repair, that means accumulate more mutations, responded better to the PD-1 treatment. And those who have Miss much repair proficient so they can repair and reduce the number of mutation, respond less. Now, the advantage of this treatment is one, less adverse effects because it's not direct damage on normal cells. Effective for a wide range of tumors, so it doesn't matter whether it's a lung tumor or the brain tumor, they can recognize. 
sustained effects to responders. Once it's respond, it appears to last very long. And also, it's possible to combine with other anti-cancer treatment to improve efficacy. Actually, currently, the only melanoma is the first line target of nivolumab or anti-PD-1 antibody. And uh, this way, survival rate uh, jumped from 20 to 30% to 70%. And chemotherapy or irradiation normally damages host immune system. So it's not good to carry out immune therapy after chemo or irradiation. The best treatment should be given first and cost saving after all. That's my uh, thinking. And actually, uh, March this year, a magazine called New Scientist, published from London, said the PD-1 therapy is cancer equivalent of penicillin. Uh, this is a chain, is the head of the tumor department of Genentech. The reason why he said so is penicillin had a strong impact of infectious diseases, but it didn't cure all the infectious diseases. But eventually, more and more antibiotics discovered, and now we are almost free from infectious diseases. So we have to improve the anti-PD-1 cancer immunotherapy or other therapy using CTL4. The query, the presence of non-responder patient in case of melanoma, at least 30%, and we don't know any biomarker to distinguish them. So what is the best strategy? Best strategy is to improve effectiveness. If it reached to 80% or 90%, we may not need biomarkers. So what do we have done? This is a very early stage, and uh, we have not published this stuff. We had several indications that the PD-1 treatment activate mitochondria of CTL, which is killer T cells, in the local lymph node of the tumor. So this is the oxygen consumption rate indicates activity of mitochondria. And this is the control IgG. This is anti-PD-1 treated animals. And animal have the carry the tumor. So you can clearly see after anti-PD-1 treatment, draining lymph node CTL has active activated mitochondrial activity. You can also see the ATP turnover. However, if you use different tumor, in this case Lewis lung cancer, which do not respond to anti-PD-1 treatment, you can clearly see the effectiveness of tumor is very bad. You don't see such mitochondrial activation. So this led us to propose, how about if we give them some mitochondrial activation chemicals? Mitochondrial, either reactive oxygen species or uncouplers that also connect ROS, might be interesting targets. So what we have done is first we test ROS and ROS generator was combined with anti-PD-1 treatment. And then, so this is just Rupelox, ROS alone has no effect. Only when combined with anti-PD-1, you can clearly see the difference. The tumor volume is excessively reduced and the survival curve very much prolonged. Then, how about uncouplers? Uncouplers, in this case, FC FCCP also worked and elongated survival. Another uncoupler, well-known DNP, also worked. So in combination with anti-PDL1, 
it also reduced the uh, tumor growth. So, Dr. Chamoto did another experiment to see connection between Ancapula and loss generation. MMTBAP is a famous scavenger which destroy all loss. So together with Ancapula and this scavenger, the effect of DNP is completely gone, suggesting the DNP effect is going through ROS generation. So uh, this is DNP, this is FCCP, both canceled by scavenger. So in summary, we think the ROS or uncouplers may activate many targets in mitochondrial uh, regulatory system and affects either lung survival of T cell or proliferation of T cell, which help the efficacy of anti-PD-1 treatment. And I hope we'll put this into clinic and help the patient. In summary, combination of mitochondrial activation drugs with PD-1 blockade dramatically enhanced the efficacy of cancer therapy in mouse model. Application to patient may cure non-responder patient. Also, mitochondrial activation could be a marker for responders. So, I'd like to thank a large number of my collaborators. As I mentioned, initial phase, Dr. Ishida, I mentioned the name of Dr. Yuai and Dr. Minato and Nishimura, but uh, this is a current group uh, working with us uh, in the love, and thank you for your attention.